All right, we'll move right into anesthesia for cesarean delivery in the obese parturient. And again, a lot of overlap with what we've already heard. I have no disclosures. And here we go again with that beautiful picture of Winston-Salem. You saw what our claim to fame is. Well, we have a second one that's appropriate for this lecture. And we are the home of Krispy Kreme Donuts. And I don't know if you've ever had that or not, but outside Krispy Kremes, they have these neon signs that say hot now. Well, when that's on, go in and um, try one of those things. They melt your mouth. It truly is amazing how that, you know, fat just goes over the top. <laughs> All right, the objectives. We're going to discuss anesthetic techniques, positioning, special equipment that may reduce um, risk in morbidly obese patients. And then at the end, we're going to focus on OSA and post-operative pain management. I know there's a lot of questions about how do you do it and what should we be doing. And by the way, that's not a double cheeseburger. That is a Krispy Kreme burger. The buns have been replaced with two Krispy Kreme donuts. So I Googled it, and it's more than 1,500 calories, 90 grams of fat, most of which are saturated. So I haven't had the... Uh, bravery to actually try one, but they're apparently a big hit at county fairs, so oh yeah. All right, there is no standard definition of what is, uh, who is an obese patient uh, in labor, but if you're five foot four, you have a BMI of 30 at only 174 pounds, and you have a BMI of 40 at 233 pounds. And who in here wouldn't welcome every single one of our patients to weigh 233 pounds or less? I don't even need to take a show of hands. So that's not why we're doing this lecture. We're actually doing a lecture because of patients that have BMIs of 40, 50, 70, 100. And this is what we're really talking about. Pleasant patient. She gave consent to use her pictures here. And it will be important. We'll talk about her a little bit later because it really does emphasize the major take-home message of this talk. Uh, trends. So uh, Dr. Palmer didn't allude to this. He said, "There's, you know, we're really good at innovate now, and there's been a lot of changes in anesthesia. Well, there's been a lot of changes in America, and only in 30, 40 years we've gone from, you know, the light blue country to reds and purples and." reds and purples are really bad. So that does affect how and what we do. This is the incidence of obesity in the last 50 years. It's skyrocketed. Um, but more importantly, the patients that we're really talking about, the morbid obese patients, the super obese, have increased proportionally more than at the lower weights. The incidence of diabetes has gone up. And even though the US doesn't track it the same way, sleep disordered breathing has gone up a lot in the last, say, 15, 20 years. And this is the number of sleep studies that have occurred in America. At Wake Forest, Barbara showed you, um, even a long time ago, we, number one, it's easy to, to, to track patients to 300 pounds, but since there wasn't a definition, we said that nobody would argue that patients that weigh 300 pounds don't you know, present a problem. And so back in the early 80s, uh, we had very few of those patients. And in fact, for the first study, it took us 12 years to capture 110 patients. We now do 120 patients a year, and 4% of our cesarean deliveries weigh over 300 pounds. We didn't coin the term, I wish we were, but now the term is super obesity for patients that have BMIs over 50. Why is this relevant? And that's because obesity uh, increases the risk of coexisting disease, and it's the coexisting disease and the obesity that uh, increase the uh, the incidence of obstetric, neonatal, surgical, and anesthetic complications. Uh, you'll see a similar pattern. We'll quickly go through these, but obesity associates with increased preeclampsia, diabetes, and as BMI increases, that odds ratio increases further. Even if you're young, same sort of pattern. These are obese patients that are teenagers. Increased incidence of um, PIH, diabetes, macrosomia. BMI is an independent risk factor for cesarean delivery same pattern as BMI increases, the risk of cesarean delivery increases, and over 35, and that's not really that much uh, of a weight as we saw earlier, still have about a 50% of a cesarean section and delivery, and that was bore out in our two studies. And even um, today, 50% of patients that weigh over 300 pounds require a cesarean delivery. And the really important point is the last 
number, which is the number of those patients that require urgent or emergency cesarean delivery is half. So we're going to have a lot of patients in, that are super obese that require cesarean deliveries, and they're going to be for emergent or emergent indications. So how do we improve risk factors or risks uh, in, in those patients? Uh, the anesthetic complications can happen labor and delivery in the OR and actually post-op. So we have failed epidurals and we have deaths from related to sleep apnea now. We don't have to go over all of these predis predisposing factors. Uh, it's related to anatomic changes, also related to physiologic changes, decreased FRC, um, obstructive sleep apnea that make positioning and taking care of these patients more difficult. ACOG has weighed in with a committee opinion, although they do that a lot, but they recommend counseling for these patients before, during, and after delivery. And the real important take home message, and you've heard this before, it's about working together. So ACOG recommends anesthesiology consultation for these morbidly obese patients. And most of the stuff you're going to hear from me is about working with your obstetric colleagues to actually come up with practice plans together. So how do we reduce risk? Well, you can't look at it in isolation for cesarean delivery because in order to reduce risk for cesarean delivery, it starts on labor and delivery and you can't end it with the PACU. It is actually post-operative care. So we're going to look at the spectrum, but we're going to mainly focus uh, in the OR and post-op. It's about a team approach, as I just said, and you need to develop practice um, guidelines for labor and delivery, post-op, but you do it with your obstetric co colleagues, you have respiratory therapy involved and nursing as well because we do work together to take care of these patients. And another take home message is elective cesarean delivery in these patients whenever possible. And since that's not always possible, at least try to get it onto the urgent side rather than the emergent side. You have to have lots of special equipment, I'm sure that you do. Uh, do you have epidural trays or CSC trays in every single OR? Because an epidural needle can really help find the spinal space, especially if you're in a hurry. Difficult innovation cart with equipment uh, that's designed for morbidly obese patients. What about your OR table? A lot of the o older tables, which might be in labor and delivery, aren't really rated, weight rated for some of these heavier patients. And a really important thing is when you're moving the patient or when you're sitting them up for a spinal, are they over the pedestal? And we had a table that nearly tipped because the patient was just slightly off center. And luckily we had people there to catch the table, so we avoided the catastrophe, but could have been bad. Stretchers, wheelchairs, surgical instruments, Montgomery staffs, I'm not sure if you use those, but it really helps our surgical colleagues by improving surgical exposure and have ventilators that can handle uh, the, these patients. Pressure support really helps. So these are some of the needles that we have available, readily available. A normal nine centimeter um, epidural needle is about four and a half inches, including the hub. I love the bottom couple needles. So our difficult airway cart, as I alluded to earlier, it's very well labeled and we make sure that it's well stocked and every time we use it, we replace it. But everything's easy to find, labeled, readily available. The OR table, make sure that you're centered over the pedestal. I look at that every single time we move one of these patients. This is surgical exposure because the Montgomery straps tied up over and it really does help the surgeons and most of our surgeons, even in these patients, will be done in about 45 minutes. So it's great. We're, we're lucky to work with them. Very few quick slides on labor and delivery, but as Barbara said, what reduces risk in this patient population? It's a functioning epidural catheter. So get the epidural catheter in early and make sure it's working and that's going to help more than almost anything else that we can do. So as Barbara showed you, the risk of initial epidural failure is about five or six times higher in these morbidly obese patients, but you take it out and repeat it till you have a good functioning epidural catheter. And then the important thing is that whether you're morbidly obese or not, that catheter is going to be work at the same rate, more than 90 some percent are going to function for cesarean delivery. So what do we do when these patients are being admitted that weigh four or 500 pounds? The nurses, the obstetricians will call us, tell us that they're there. We do a consult early and many times we ask the patients, all we need is a commitment to deliver from the obstetricians. We will place the epidural before they're even in labor, make sure it's functioning, you know, we'll use some lidocaine and then later we'll dose it whenever they actually do start to hurt. 
and we replace it until we do have that well-functioning catheter. So this is a little picture that I drew. You know, you may, it may be difficult to, to palpate landmarks. So what we typically do is these patients do have like a horizontal skin fold in the lower lumbar area. You go to the bottom aspect of that skin fold uh, in midline with gluteal folds in the middle of the neck. And it's great when the patients actually look like that, but they don't always. And so you just do the best that you can and you make do. And in this patient, that tape really helped us get better exposure for that probably did a CSC. So in the OR, elective whenever possible. And then, you know, I guess I'm not going to, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this because you're already doing it. And it depends on the airway, but it also depends on um, the patients and how long they take to do the surgery. So an epidural CSC or spinal could be appropriate in all these patients. That one patient that I told you earlier, she was 400 some pounds, but she was six foot tall and had a class one airway. So I did do a spinal on her and yeah. she immediately said, I can't breathe and developed a high spinal, it's great. But she was very easy to innovate. So to, to Barbara's point, what if she wasn't six foot tall and what if I didn't do that airway exam and what if I did do that spinal, it could have been a potential catastrophe. And so with all of that, I wouldn't have done a one shot spinal. We would have done an epidural or CSC with reduced doses. Now, when you have that urgent or emergent cesarean delivery, the anesthetic should be dictated by the setting, the airway exam, and if at all possible, you know, regional anesthesia. Sometimes it's not possible. So as I mentioned before, high spinals are more likely in, in obese parturients. Number one, they have decreased CSF volume. And so the, Virginia Mason did the same kind of study, and it's even more so in obese patients than it is in non-obese patients. So instead of being a two-fold difference in CSF volume, it could be as high as three and a half fold. So some of these morbid obese patients have CSF volumes of only 20 some mLs. And almost for certain in that patient, you do a full 12 milligram uh, spinal, you could potentially get a high spinal block. But another important factor is also adipose tissue distribution. And when I lay these patients down, I'm always cranking the head and looking at that adipose tissue distribution, because you can see the picture on the bottom that they're already in Trendelenburg positioning, and that could increase the likelihood of a high block or high neur uh, neuraxial block. So I crank the head, and I'll adjust the bed so that the vertebral column is parallel to the floor. In an emergent situation, if the airway is good, you may decide that you're going to proceed with general anesthesia. Uh, and before we do that, so if they have that pre-existing epidural, I think I told you in the last lecture, for obese patients, dose them in the OR. But in an emergent situation, actually dosing them safely on the way to the OR may reduce the risk of, of requiring general anesthesia. So you, as you're disconnecting the epidural catheter, 5 mLs, Bolus, you wait you know, 30 seconds, they don't have any symptoms. Five more mLs as you're going down the hall, as you're going into the OR, five more mLs. And just that alone, that 15 or 20 mLs, and you've done it safely because you've done it over two or three minutes, um, will potentially give you a surgical block, or at least well on the way to a surgical block, so you can just supplement rather than having to convert to general anesthesia. If the airway is really, really bad, then try to hurry up and get to the OR and dose in the OR. Another important point is when you get to the OR, check the fetal heart rate always because it may now have been improved, which then working with your obstetric colleagues allows you and buys you extra time to get these patients ready. So remember that um, there is no such thing as a quick spinal until after you're done with a quick spinal, especially in some of these morbidly obese patients. So you have the best of intentions, but it might take you 45 minutes to get that spinal in. So when you start having trouble, if there is any difficulty, Think about it, an epidural needle as an introducer can really be beneficial. So the important part, if you do do that, that you have appropriately matched spinal needles so that it protrudes about one to one and a half centimeters past the tip of the epidural needle. It's a CSC. To Dr. Palmer's point yesterday, if you happen to get a wet tap, great, insert the, the epidural catheter and do a spinal technique. I mean, and that really is what can reduce risk, and we'll talk about a little bit more, but it minimizes the risk for both spinal and epidural and maximizes the benefits of each, the titratability of an epidural, but the reliability of a spinal. Another important point is that you need to monitor the fetal heart rate continuously if you can, but you can't in these patients. So 
with the help of nursing, every 10 minutes, they remind us, because 10 minutes goes by quick whenever you're fla flailing at the spinal or epidural. So we'll stop, put the patient back a little bit, check the baby's heart rate, and then proceed. And if it was called STAT and you exceed that 30 minute rule, even though we're trying to get rid of it, lawyers know that it exists, you have to document why you proceeded and why you exceeded that rule. Documentation's critical and you know, it's something that we don't really think of as much as we should. Even though I keep saying regional, 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 it's not always gonna happen, so you have to be prepared. Airway exam should dictate the plan. And in a good airway, as I said before, you can proceed with rapid sequence induction, but you dose based on lean body mass, not total body weight. And if you have that bad airway, you have other options. The video laryngoscope, awake innovation, CSC with, re with reduced dose if you're doing the regional. But um, you have to have your special equipment readily available. And an important point is that it only takes a few seconds to actually maximize optimal innovating conditions, and we don't always do that. So here's one of our labor nurses, and I used her as an example because this is great. If it was an emergency, we would all probably look at this patient and say, all right, she's not optimal, but I can innovate because I'm good. Great. It only takes a few seconds to optimize her. You should be looking at an imaginary line between the external auditory meatus and the sternal notch. And that line should be parallel with the floor. And you can see that it clearly is not in her. And I probably over-exaggerated this, but um, it, it looked good at the time, and now it looks like, dang. So anyway, you can see, <laughs> and, and all of you would agree, though, that I would rather innovate her now than I would have a little bit ago. Well, in a real emergency, you may not have time to get all this stuff, so you can still do it just by using your OR table, and I do this all the time. Reverse your Nolenberg, put the head down, and again, she's opt optimized much, much better, and it literally takes 10 seconds to get in that position. So we talked about good airway and a bad airway, but what about the really, really bad airway? The patients that are class four, the patients that have had failed innovations in the past, and like multiple anesthesia providers have tried. So in that particular case, you may need or call for a surgical airway. The obstetrician can't do that, so you may have to call for an ENT consult. Well, in that situation, a really, really good technique that could potentially bail you out is that continuous spinal catheter. So it's an emergent cesarean delivery, the baby's heart rate's down, you don't think that you can innovate, you don't want to proceed, you call for an ENT surgeon, before they even get there, you could potentially have located the spinal space, put the epidural catheter in, and then you could dose it slowly so that you minimize the risk of getting that high spinal and having to deal with that airway because if this patient truly has that really, really bad airway, she could die from trying to, to, to intubate. Um, Dr. Palmer talked about this yesterday, but residents fail this question all the time. Do so you get a spinal catheter? How much cocaine do you administer? Oh, I'll give my 12 milligrams. Wrong. Y'all need probably five milligrams. And with five milligrams and probably 70 percent of the patients, you're going to have surgical anesthesia. And if it's not quite dense enough, you can add another 1.25 milligrams of bupivacaine or, you know, two and a half milligrams. Now, many times five milligrams is enough, but about a half hour into the case, the patient will say, oh, I feel a little, you know, burning. Just administer a little bit more bupivacaine. You can add fentanyl to it. You can add your morphine to it as well. On labor, you basically do CSE doses, as Dr. Palmer said yesterday. And it's important that you're using tiny little doses, so you want to flush your catheter every time with one or two mLs of saline to make sure that your dose is actually administered into the spinal space. As Barbara just alluded to, I can't stress enough that in these super obese patients, they're usually going to have lots of comorbidity. What makes it safer for them is a multidisciplinary team approach. I've said some of the things and how we work together by the early consults on labor and delivery, by the nurses reminding us when 10 minutes are up. Well, the surgeons um, have actually helped us because now they're doing a lot of these patients with the periumbilical um, surgical approach. They actually use a reverse Trendelenburg position, make an up and down incision that goes up to the umbilicus, and they do a classical incision of fundal delivery. But it really does help with the rest respiratory dynamics of our patients. Many of these patients can't lie flat, but you have to if you're doing a fan and steel incision. And again, a continuous spinal is something that should be considered in these patients. 
And you're going to see that over and over again, elective whenever possible, and now it's time to talk about our patient. Very pleasant. This is what her airway looked like. And I wish I took a better picture, but even with a better look, it wasn't any better. So it was ideal. She was a scheduled cesarean delivery. It was during the morning. We had everybody there. We had lots of anesthesia help. I actually would have done a continuous spinal catheter technique for her, but my partners actually took care of them. They decided that, nope, this is going to be a really bad error. We're going to tackle the airway. Ideal circumstances. So they moved her over to the bed, nebulized lidocaine, lots of blocks, and Despite the lecture we heard yesterday about NPO status and nothing in the stomach, every time that they put in the bronchoscope, she had copious amounts of vomitus and was bucking and the block didn't work, which is no big surprise. And so even the most skilled people with uh, bronchoscopy, it took us 45 minutes to secure that airway. And this is ideal. So you can imagine and by the way, she did fine, baby did fine, but in an emergency, the obstetricians, the baby's heart rate was down, and the obstetricians were saying, we need to go, we need to go, we need to go. You look at that airway, and you could feel pressure to put her to sleep, and there isn't a doubt in my mind, had we induced general anesthesia in her, she very well could be dead today. So elective whenever possible, if you can. And then this is really actually something I talk to the residents about all the time, but it's easier said than done. And in that situation, and you have that pressure to proceed, you know, the obstetricians will say, yeah, yeah, well, we're worried about the mom too. But the reality is in that situation, they're worried about the baby and it's up to us to make decisions. And you have to document those decisions and it should be after carefully weighing all the risks and benefits. And if the baby dies, but you do that to secure the airway by either surgical airway or with that continuous spinal, you document it and you do the best you can. But, you know, again, that's easier said than done. So let's move a little bit to the shifting sands and the anesthesia risk from the intraoperative and during induction to the postoperative um, areas. So as Barbara showed you, uh, Jill Meyer published a paper on eight anesthesia-related deaths in Michigan. There were no deaths during induction. All of the deaths happened with emergence and postoperatively, and the biggest risk factor was obesity and African American. As I showed earlier, uh, obesity is in associated with an increased risk of OSA, and this was a big data study just recently published, and the incidence of OSA has increased tenfold in only 10 years. And here's what's concerning that the odds ratio of eclampsia, cardiomyopathy, pulmonary embolism, and in-hospital mortality is five to ten or to nine times higher in patients with OSA. And more of our patients have sleep disorder breathing now than ever before. So what do we do about them? Well, I urge all of you, if you haven't already incorporated them into your, your practices, to look at the ASA, OSA guidelines that were recently updated in 2014 because it makes recommendations for the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care of these patients. And we've looked at that carefully, incorporated a lot of those recommendations into our practice. Uh, basically, to, to use regional if you can, to avoid opioid, opioids if you, if you can. But for these patients having abdominal surgery, you're going to have to. And if you do a neuroaxial block, then consider opioids, supplement with NSAIDs. Uh, supplemental oxygen and CPAP whenever feasible, but also has recommendations for monitoring afterwards. This is one of our patients, had nasal CPAP. We used it intraoperatively and postoperatively. She did well. So what do we do at Wake Forest? Well, all of our patients having GYN surgery and cesarean delivery have a nursing screen that was based off the OSA uh, guidelines. And if that nursing tool screen is positive, it automatically generates in the anesthesia screen. And if that's positive, then we assign the patients a OSA bed in our, our um, women's center. 
And that OSA bed has the ability for end tidal CO2 monitoring and continuous oximetry. But most importantly into it, it's a mechanism that if the patients have problems, it automatically generates a respiratory therapy consult. And if they can't fix the problem and there still is ongoing problems, it is automatically generates a pulmonary consult, which will probably get the patient moved to the intensive care unit. Um, these now, so I have these as paper, but it's all electronic now, and I'll be glad to share these with you. We're not going over it, but the nursing screen takes about 15 seconds to complete, so it really doesn't take them a lot of time. Anesthesia then revisits that screen and does ours. It takes about 15 seconds, not a lot of time. And then this is how we work together. We'll write the orders, but the surgeon has to order the OSA bed so that they know that their patient is actually going to the OSA bed and that's just better for the continuum of care. So we do that together. Um, there's some misconception too that PCA is a lot safer. So if I'm gonna do a regional, I'm not gonna add morphine or whatever. There's, if not uh, as many, there are more deaths uh, related to PCA administration. Uh, APSF uh, talks about that all the time, closed claims, verifies that. So when we administer regional anesthesia, we'll use morphine. Uh, spinally or epidurally, same doses. We do general, we'll start them on PCA. We add ibuprofen and oxygen as needed, and then we'll have them to the uh, OSA, we'll, we'll assign patients to the OSA bed. Now, we do have that OSA monitoring capability, and I know all of you don't have that. So what should happen? Well, you can use continuous oximetry as recommended by the guidelines, but you have to have the capability to monitor patients. So it's not good enough to put the patients in a bed and um, have no one there to hear that alarm. So in our hospital, all the other floors have central monitoring of oximetry patients, but on, in the Women's Center, we also have that capnography capability. If you don't have the ability to do that, then you may have to send a patient to a monitored bed. But you know, a real question, a real dissatisfier is if she just had a baby, you can't bring the baby to that ICU potentially, and then the patients are gonna wanna be moved, and then that puts them at risk. So you have to have a mechanism to try to, to, to make that happen if at all possible, and that's why we have special monitoring in our unit, because the babies stay with the mom. So in summary, there's an increasing prevalence of obesity, and that leads to increasing comorbidity and increasing peripartum risk. More likely in obese patients are initial epidural failure, cesarean delivery, urgent cesarean delivery, equipment failure, difficult intubation, and post-operative complications. So develop practice guidelines with your obstetric and nursing colleagues, respiratory therapy, that those guidelines should involve an early anesthesia consultation. If they're having cesarean delivery, see them in the pre-op clinic. If you don't have one, find a way to make that happen and develop one. And if they're on labor and delivery, early consult. Early epidural and have a well-functioning catheter. If it's a labor patient, best thing you can do for cesarean delivery. And in the OR, your technique's gonna be dictated by the airway and your own uh, surgical needs. Elective whenever possible and use that multidisciplinary team for the super obese patients. And then you should also develop as part of your guidelines, post-operative management that has a focus on OSA and sleep disorder breathing. So one of my favorite proverbs, good judgment comes from experience, and experience, well, that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> so hopefully attending lectures like this, you know, you get a little bit more uh, good judgment. This has nothing to do with the lecture, but I love it. It's amazing that water carved all of this through the rocks and the water was so powerful that it was rolling that big boulder like a pebble, and there it is just floating in the air. It's really cool. So if any of you want any of my slides or any of these talks, just uh, please email me at rdangelo at wakehealth.com. I'll be glad to share with the information with you, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.